everybody, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you for joining us in our online church community. We're in a series called Broken Halos where we're exploring what it means to have faith in the reality of everyday life through the joys, through the pains, through the ups, through the downs, through the problems, through the issues. What does it really look like to live out our faith seven days a week? So join us as we travel through this journey together because everybody's welcome, anything's possible, and nobody's perfect. Church, how we doing? Yeah. Hey, give it up for the band. Come on. Are you kidding me? Oh, that song. I love that last song. I love all the songs. But that last song, that anthem, Forever We're Free, I was just fired up. Woo! Okay. Hey, make sure you have notes. Make sure you have notes. And uh, uh, look at your notes there. You'll notice there's like a ton of stuff to fill out. And uh, sometimes I get real spunky during the week, and I think that I have two hours to talk to you. And then last night when I, I practice my message, I go over and over and over and I realize that is way too much information, man. So I am actually going to cut this message in half. So next week, you have to come back. It's going to be a cliffhanger. <laughs> come back next week for the second part. We're going to look today at the first part, those first five things we're going to go over. And then I have an announcement for you at the end that I'm really excited about and we're going to share with you. And so I wanted to make sure you knew that so that at the end when you go, hey, there's still these things to fill out. Because I know how some of us are, right? We've got to have our fill-ins filled in. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, you know. Next week, come back, and we'll have more of this talk on faith versus fear. I'm going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. If you have your Bibles, Numbers, you're like, there's a book in the Bible called Numbers? Yep. Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And I know when you woke up this morning, you were thinking, oh, I hope Pastor Jeremy talks about the book of Numbers today. I really, that's my devotional life, right? Now, now, even though this is an obscure, in many ways, book in the Old Testament, and even though it has a lot of genealogies in it and things like that, man, it is an incredible book. There are some incredible spiritual truths that I'm going to pull out that we're going to see today as we talk about the subject of faith versus fear. And I want to welcome you to our brand new teaching series. All those of you watching on our online church, we welcome you, everybody out in the patio and in the cafe as well. Really glad you're joining us today. And uh, the series is all about faith. We're talking about broken halos. It's a series that really is about faith. I'm going to stretch your faith during this series. All right, your faith is going to be stretched. And, and that's important because uh, I need to challenge your faith. You know, As your pastor, it's important that you're always thinking about your next steps of faith and how, how you're supposed to grow. Okay, that's important because we all tend to move towards comfort in our life. That's just what we do. We tend to move towards what's comfortable. Yet, if we're really going to live the life God's called us to live, our faith has to be stretched. It has to be grown. That's why it's called growing pains. It's not comfortable, right? It's not called comfort pains. <laughs> it's called growing pains because some things can get uncomfortable. But in this series called Broken Halos, the big idea behind the broken halos is that we all live an imperfect faith journey. It's not about a perfect journey. All right. It's not about never doubting. It's not about never blowing it. It's not about never. It's, it's about how do we keep moving forward in the realities of our daily lives, the stresses, the problems, the pains, the joys, the highs, the lows, everything else. How do we keep moving forward in that? And that's what we want to talk about because our job as pastors, right, is to, is to, uh, what's that term? What's that term? Is to Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah, some of you are like, what? Oh, <laughs> some of you will get that lunch today. But anyway, all right, so it's not, we're, we're calling it this, we live this imperfect faith journey. If there were halos over our head right now, we would see cracks in them. Some of our halos would be duct taped, stapled, gorilla glued. Right? That's the way it would look, and they'd be kind of skew a little bit. That's just the reality of our life. That's how our life is. But you and I, we have to have it stretched, our faith. Too many people settle for less in their faith walk journey. And part of my job as lead shepherd under Jesus is to prod the cattle a little bit, prod the sheep, in other words, get you going a little bit and stretch that faith because I don't want you to miss out on anything God has for you. And I know all that he has for you takes stretching your faith. So we want to look at that throughout the course of this series. The Bible says, look on your outline there or on the screen, Romans 1.17, talking about this whole faith journey. 
This good news, of course, the good news is the gospel. Some translations will just say gospel. This gospel, this good news tells us that God makes us right in his sight when we put our faith and trust in Christ to save us. Right? That's huge. This is accomplished from start to finish by what? Faith. Yeah. As the scripture says it, the man who finds life will find it through trusting God. What are you talking about? True life. Through trusting Christ. That's how you're going to find true life. Life to the full. All of that. And then look at the next verse of Hebrews 11.6. Makes it very, very clear. Without faith, it is what? Impossible. Yeah, to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I want you to circle earnestly there in your notes. This is so important. Did you know that God rewards those who earnestly seek him? Notice it doesn't say he rewards those who perfectly seek him. Because none of us do. But it's with an earnest heart. It's like, God, I, I want what you have for me. I want what's next in my faith development and journey. Don't settle. Don't settle. And so he says, earnestly seek me. I'll show you what that is. Now, if the Bible says the way to live is by faith, and the way we connect with God is by faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God, then what is faith? And here's the reality of faith. It's multifaceted. Faith is like a diamond. You look at it, man, it's got so many, so many uh, facets to it. Same thing with faith. There's a lot of facets to faith, multifaceted. So as we start off, kind of an introduction this weekend, what I want you to see is that first fill-in, is that really faith is seen from God's perspective. That's what faith is. That's the way we're going to look at it for this section. It's seen from God's point of view. It's, listen, faith is not a feeling. You've got to understand, faith is not a feeling. It's not having a quiver in your liver, you know, oh, I'm feel like faith today. No, that's not what it is. Sometimes our feelings get in the way of our faith. We know what we should be doing by faith, but we don't feel like it, so we don't do it. All right, so faith is more than feelings, that's for sure. Uh, faith is not bargaining with God either. It's not saying, God, if you do this, I'll do that in faith. <laughs> it's not that. It's not bargaining with God. We're going to look at it today that faith is a, a way of seeing it's a way of looking at the world from God's point of view, God's perspective on life. Now, let me show you a couple of verses. Let, Hebrews 11.1, 1, very important verse. What is faith? The Bible says it is the confident assurance that something we want is going to happen. It's the certainty that what we hope for is waiting for us even though we cannot see it up ahead. I want you to circle even though I cannot see it. We cannot see it. All right. Part of my job as a pastor is helping you see things up ahead that you cannot see right now. It's called vision casting. When we started the church, I casted a vision. I believe God told me to do this. It was very clear to me that we were supposed to start a church. I started casting the vision to people. And other people said, man, I want to be part of that. Right now, at Captivate Church in Point Loma, Pastor Wes had taken the year to cast vision to people. And he's gathered up a group of people. And now today, the fulfillment of that vision, the beginning of a church, another church in San Diego to reach more people in that area is starting. Why? Because what do we do? We're trying to help you see something that you can't see yet. That's what vision casting is. And so that's part of our job as leaders and pastors. I want to help you see something that you can't see yet. All right? And I'm excited about sharing the vision about how we're going to expand and how we're going to grow. And, you know, when we started, we had... We had me and my wife, and then we gathered up some other leaders, and then it started to grow. And, and, and man, to imagine that a couple weeks ago, we had over 1,600 people on this campus. It's just, that's incredible, right? It's incredible to think, and we don't have room for them. <laughs> that's the reality. That's the reality. But it was incredible to see that, to see the excitement and the activity of what could be every week. I want you to circle the phrase, I already mentioned that, we cannot see. Faith is being certain of things we do not see. It has to do with your vision. The Bible says that faith is a way of seeing. Now, how many would agree there's different ways to see things? There's different ways to see, yeah. And if you're married, you're like, oh yeah, right, huh? Come on, we know. And if you have kids, different ways of seeing things. We all just have different ways of seeing things. But here's the reality. It really doesn't matter at, at the end of the day the way you see it. It doesn't matter the way I see it. What really matters is the way God sees it. And that's what we're trying to get to. We want to get a vision for our lives that God has for our lives. We want to be able to see from his perspective. Because when we do that, it makes all the difference in our life. It makes all the difference. Ephesians 1.18 
Check it out. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can see something of the future that he has called you to share. So today, I want us to look at what happens when we see with eyes of fear. And next week, what happens when we see with eyes of faith. We want to look at this. Kind of an introduction, because until you understand how, it is impor- how important it is to see everything through the eyes of faith, you're not going to be growing as a Christian as you should. You're not going to be able to walk in all that God has for you if you're not growing in that way. A good example of this is the Old Testament book of Numbers, okay? Chapters 13 and 14. Chapters 13 and 14 is an incredible story. Israelites have been uh, miraculously uh, removed from Egypt. God busted them out of Egypt, like 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And God says, it's time for me to take you to your promised land. I got a land mapped out for you. It's beautiful. It's flowing with milk and honey, which is an illustration of how fertile the land is. And you guys, I've, I've reserved it for you. You need to walk in it. So he gets them out of Egypt. God defeats Pharaoh's army. We know uh, the story of him crossing the Red Sea. It parts and all that. And miraculous things happening all the way through. There are two years going towards the promised land for two years. They get to the edge of the promised land. They're ready to go in. And Moses says, I'm going to send 12 spies to spy out the land, map it out so we can kind of see where we need to go and how we need to go about it, okay? One leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So they go. They map it out. The 12 spies come back. First two to report is Joshua and Caleb. They say, it's unbelievable. They're so fired up. They're so excited. They're like, let's go now. Let's go. We're fired up. We're excited. Let's take the land. This is so exciting. Thank you, Jesus. You know, they're just fired up. Okay? Picturing that. Okay, so, but there was 10 others that said this. Yeah, it's good, but we can't take it. It's good. They're right. It's, you know, and they brought back fruit like grapes that were like bowling balls. That's why I picture it. It's just huge, right? And they're like, this, look at this. And 10 of them said, no, 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 we can't do it. We can't do it. And you know what happened? Those 10 negative Nellies, those 10 Debbie Downers, those 10 influenced the rest of Israel. And so they didn't walk in it. They didn't take it over. They weren't seeing with eyes of faith. 10 of them saw with eyes of fear. Two of them saw with eyes of faith. Joshua and Caleb saw with eyes of faith. I'm going to name the 10 that saw with eyes of fear. These are the ten leaders of the ten tribes, okay? Just listen to these names. Shaphat, Egal, Palti, Gadiel, Amiel, Sethur, Nabi, Geuel, Shamua, not the whale, and then <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. Here's a point. Nobody remembers those ten names. Nobody remembers those ten negative Nellies. Nobody names their kid. I don't know any kid named Geuel. I don't know any kid named Shamu. I don't know any kid. <laughs> right? Nobody names their kids after these negative Nellies. All right? Palti? No. Egal? Hope not. Listen, the reality is, right, but I know a lot of kids, and you probably have some kids named Joshua and Caleb. You know why? Because they had eyes of faith. They had vision to see something the rest of them couldn't. They had courage to walk in it. They said, we're taking it. Let's go. What are we doing? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Negative people are not changing the world. They're complaining about it. Negative people, while negative people are complaining and whining and moaning about the world, positive, optimistic, faith-filled people are changing it. That's the difference. Nobody remembers negative people, critics, the only people that get things that, that are remembered are the people that said, let's do it in God's name. And these guys saw with eyes of faith. Now, because the rest of them decided not to see with eyes of faith, and they infected everybody else. Those ten infected everybody else. And I'm going to read the story in a moment. They, they completely got everybody on a bandwagon of, we can't do it. We're not going to do it. And everybody got negative, And so God said, fine. All of you negative Nellies, you don't get to go into the promised land. Just Joshua and Caleb in the future. 
So they were kept out of the promised land. And for 40 more years, they wandered around the wilderness and they all died except for Joshua and Caleb. So they didn't get to go in. They failed the test. Listen, I don't want you to wander around in whatever wilderness it is in your life because of negativity. I want you to be able to walk in what God has for you. But I'm going to tell you this. You won't get there with a negative attitude. You won't get there by seeing everything through eyes of fear. You can't get there that way. You have to see through eyes of faith. And you have to walk in your promised land. I don't know what it is for you. You probably have a thought on that right now. But you've got to walk in your purpose, what God has for you to move forward. So what happens when we see with eyes of fear? We're going to look right through Numbers 13 and 14. Number one, when we see with eyes of fear, here's the reality. We exaggerate our difficulties. We exaggerate our difficulties or our problems, right? We exaggerate. They become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's the amazing thing. God just delivered them from Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world at the time. He delivered them from the most powerful king, the Pharaoh. I mean, it was miraculous. Not only did he deliver them, he plundered them. He plundered the Egyptians. So they're, they're carrying out loot, man, silver like crazy, gold all over the place. They're carrying it with them as they go. God said, I'm taking care of you. They just defeated him. And yet they're worried about a tiny little tribe in the promised land. <laughs> they're all concerned. Why? Because our problems, the more we think about them, we exaggerate them. The more fearful we are, we get more fearful. It's just like criticism. If someone criticizes you at work or in your neighborhood or family member, whatever, you start to process that, right? You let it linger in your head, and it gets bigger and bigger. And if you go on Facebook or social media, and you start looking, and you, all of a sudden you start reading into comments, and you start reading into things, and you're going, well, they're criticizing me too. Everybody's against me. It's just all of a sudden, right? Because why? We're exaggerating our difficulty. We're starting to think with fear. Check this out in Numbers 13, 27, and 28. Okay. <laughs> he says, look, it's a magnificent land. Okay, That's the other 10. This is their report. But. It's a magnificent land. But the people living there are powerful. And their cities are fortified and large. What's more, we saw Anakim giants there. You'd be scared too if Luke Skywalker's there with a the thing, right? <laughs> and so there were Anakim giants. They were the, the descendants of the Nephilim, which is a further study. But these, these were giant people. They were literally large, large people. Okay, so, so pause there for a second. You look at that, and, and he says, man, the negativity's already surrounded. They said, yeah, it is a beautiful land. But look at the next part of the verse. They keep going. They say, other spies said this, they'd crush us. So the majority report of the spies was what? Yes. I want to point something out here. The majority report often is negative. If you listen to everybody else, it's often negative. It's often negative. Okay, because people look with eyes of fear. That's our culture, unfortunately. That's the way we do it. They, they said, we see these people and they'd crush us. The word there in Hebrew for crush us is, is actually the word akal. Now, why is that important? Because it literally means to be eaten up. And so what you, to, to, to devour, it's this idea. One of the scariest things is to think about being eaten alive by somebody, is it not? Cannibalism? Cannibalism is disgusting. It's a horrible thing, right? That's one of the scariest things. So here's what I'm picturing. They're coming back to the other people. They're going, hey, they're cannibals over there. We're not taking that land. Do you want to be eaten? Bob, you? No? Okay, well, let's not do it then. Okay, and they're like, yeah, I don't want to be eaten. Well, they're going to start with your kids. Your kids are little. And so you can see that rumor starting to spread. They'll crush us. They'll akal. They're going to eat us. And so everyone's going, I ain't going. Don't want to do it. And so the negativity spreads. Only two of them said, what are you guys talking about? Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because there's always more worriers out there, more naysayers, more critics. Why? Misery loves company. It's so easy to attach with negative people. Say, yeah, I don't like it either. And I don't like that. And here's the problem. Negative attitudes are contagious. They're contagious. So remember this. In your workplace, negative attitude is contagious. At home. Negative attitude is contagious. In your neighborhood, negative attitude is contagious. The good news is positive attitude can be contagious as well. You turn it around because a positive attitude has faith. You're working with faith 
when you have a positive attitude. Having a positive attitude and a faith-filled attitude isn't saying the world isn't tough and difficult. It's not saying that. It's saying, in spite of the fact that the world is tough and difficult, I'm having a faith-filled attitude, a positive attitude. I'm looking forward to what God has. All right, secondly, I want you to see this part. Number two, we underestimate our own ability. So first, we exaggerate the problem, and then we underestimate our ability to deal with the problem. We see this in Numbers 13, 33. Look at this. I love this. It says, We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Now, here's another interesting thing. So it says grasshoppers, right? Very similar to locusts. And those were very much, very common to be eaten in those days. Very common. All right? It was a food. And so what are they saying? Again, it goes back to the cannibalism. They're scaring everybody. They're saying, look, we look like grasshoppers grasshoppers to them. We look like food to them. And so they're continuing to spread this rumor that we we can't do it. We can't do it. You talk about low self-esteem. They're saying we're insects. We're a bunch of bugs compared to those guys. They're going to crush us. We can't do it. And he says, we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. That's our own self-image. But notice they said, we look like that to them too. How do you know what you look like to them? They don't know. Okay, but what are they doing? There's a word, it's called fear projection. We do this. We tend to project our fears on everybody else around us, and that's what they're doing here. They're projecting their fears. They've been slaves for 400 years. They've been freed for two, but they're still mentally enslaved to the condition. They still see themselves as helpless. They still see themselves as slaves. That was a problem. They're enslaved, not by Pharaoh, not by an idea, an image, a concept, no, But I want to stop here for a second because many years ago, people said things to you, maybe behind your back, maybe you overheard it. They weren't true, but you heard it, and you still are enslaved by those comments. Could be stuff like you're ugly, could be stuff like uh, you'll never amount to much. You're uncoordinated, so you go around thinking, I'm uncoordinated, I can't do anything. Uh, you're a terrible speaker, so you'll never uh, try to be a public speaker because you, someone said that. That's an enslavement. Right? And so you continue to let that roll around in your head, but you need to know you're not in Egypt anymore. That's a self-imposed prison. You can break out of that. Don't, es- don't underestimate your own abilities. Based on what someone said to you in your past, don't do that. Third, third thing that happens when you see with eyes of fear. Notice how these build on each other. This is a process that happens. If you know someone who's walked away from their faith, this is the process they went through. Okay? This is, I mean, every time. This is a pattern. We get discouraged. This is the third thing. This is the pattern. We overestimate the problem. We underestimate our ability. And then we just get discouraged. We get down. Numbers 14.1. Look how this happens. Then all the people began weeping aloud, and they carried on all night. This was the ultimate pity party. Everyone's just whining and complaining all night about how difficult it is in the promised land. They'd already forgotten God brought you through the Red Sea. You remember it parted? Remember God went before you during the day in a cloud and at night it was a pillar of fire guiding you at night. Don't you remember these things? Nope, nope. We're not going to make it. They get discouraged. By the way, The devil loves discouraged people because once you get discouraged, he knows he's got you. He knows he's got you. So you've got to be so, so careful not to get discouraged, to have a mind of hope. And then let's quickly move to number four. This is the pattern. Then we start to complain about our lives. Complainers are discouraged people. We start, we get discouraged, and then we just decide we're going to complain. Everything's going wrong in our lives. Numbers 14, 2. After the all-night pity party, look what they say. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Man, we wish we had died in Egypt, they wailed. Or even here, in this wilderness. But we don't want to go over there and get eaten. And you can just picture Debbie Downer, right? First they cry, now they complain. Why? They're discontent. By the way, let me just say this. Someone who is chronically critical 
about life and about people, uh, especially when they're chronically critical about people, about others. That's a highly insecure person. Highly insecure. Why? They don't feel good about themselves. And so they certainly don't want you feeling good about yourself. And they feel like, if I can just knock you down, it somehow make them feel up. But the reality is, as they're trying to knock someone down, they're just knocking themselves down farther and farther. Someone who's highly critical, all you can do with them, pray for their heart. Just keep praying for their heart. All right. They're incredibly insecure type people. But we underestimate our own abilities. We get discouraged. We complain about our lives. And here's the last thing that happens every single time. We eventually give up and blame God. That's what happens. That's the pattern. We give up and we say, it's your fault. It's your fault, God. Watch this. Numbers 14.3. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land to be killed with swords? We'd be better off going back to Egypt. Hold on a second. <laughs> the Lord brought them out of Egypt miraculously, provides for them in the wilderness miraculously, is taking care of. And the Bible says their sandals didn't wear out, their clothes never got holes in them, and yet, why did he bring us out here to kill us? Now they're blaming God. Here's God saying, I provided this incredible land for you, I want you to walk in it in faith. I'm going to keep providing for you, but look at the beauty of this land. Look at this. I'm providing it for you. And they go, no, we're not going to do it. Why don't, why don't we go back to Egypt? Hold, hold on a second. A couple things. Go back to Egypt, your life of slavery? Part of it is they're saying, we know better than God. We know what's better for us than you, God. All right? And we do that. We do that. When we don't walk in faith, we're saying, God, I know what's better for me than you. That's really what it is. They're blaming God for not letting them go to the promised land, yet God isn't holding them back. The only thing holding them back is fear. Their fear is what was holding them back. They're second guessing. Now, all of a sudden, they're remembering the good old days of Egypt. They're, they're looking at it and they're going, yeah, I remember that. Why did they say that? Because at least it was predictable. It was predictable. They can go, well, at least we knew what we're doing every day. Yeah, there was chains. Yeah, it was difficult. But at least it was predictable. You know what that's called? It's called safe slavery. And a lot of us settle for that in our life. Safe slavery. I'm not going to risk faith. I'm not going to step out in faith because this is safe. At least I know what I'm doing. It's predictable. A lot of people get enslaved by a relationship. Safe slavery. It's not healthy. It's not good at all. But it's safe. It's safe slavery. A lot of people get enslaved by fear, by a habit. It's not a good habit. Yeah, but at least it's predictable. They're enslaved by a compulsion. They're enslaved by a thought. And the risk of faith is scary. It's scary. And so the risk of something new is scary. And so the Israelites, they don't want to do it. Because it's unpredictable. It's a risk. Faith is. <laughs> Stepping out in faith. But, it's, but here's the thing. It's not a risk when it's with God. It's the safest place to be is walking out on faith with God. <laughs> way, way safer than staying back in Egypt in the slavery of that moment. Okay. And sometimes we confuse slavery and safety. I know it's a bad situation, but at least it's predictable. I know this habit is self-defeating, but at least it's comfortable. It's just who I am. It's what I do. There's no real freedom, though, without taking risk. Safety and freedom are at the opposite ends of the continuum. Some of you need to go ahead and get that other job. Some of you need to go ahead and, and start a business. Some of you need to go ahead and whatever it is. What is God telling you right now? You know what it is. Some of you need to do it. God made you to be a risk taker. He made you to live by faith. He doesn't want you to die in the desert of your fear. Now next week I'm going to contrast that with what the Bible says about when we start to live our lives seeing through the eyes of faith. You're going to see the difference next week. Part two, learning to be a dreamer, learning to see God's vision, learning to look at things not as they are but as they could B. So we'll continue that part next week, okay? But I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give the announcement.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. God, we all deal with these eyes of fear. And sometimes it's like, man, we get out and we start uh, walking with eyes of faith. And it, all of a sudden we slip back into having eyes of fear. But, Lord, you have a promised land for every single one of us. You have a situation. You have a, um, a life that is filled with faith. Some here are walking in it right now. Others, though, they, they're stuck in Egypt. And so, God, just bless them. Give them a vision for your future, for what you have for them, for why you created them. Every single one of us has a purpose. You've made that very clear. Some, it takes longer to figure it out than others. So help them, Lord. Help them. Some of you, the first thing you need to do, whether you're watching online or you're here in the building, is say yes to Jesus. That's where it all starts. Your purpose for life starts right there. I want to encourage you in your heart. He can hear you. Just say this. Say, dear Jesus, I want to know you. Come into my life. Fill my life with faith, not fear. I trust you from this day forward. If you said that, there's a place you can mark it on your connection card. There's a box there that says, I said yes to Jesus today for the first time. Online, there's a connection card online. You can click the box there as well. Others of you, maybe it's a recommitment. You'd say, you know what? It's time. It's time for me to quit fooling around, walking around in fear, being worried, being discouraged, seeing my problems as bigger than they are and underestimating underestimating my own abilities. It's time. Say, God, I'm recommitting my life to you today. Jesus, come into my life. Guide me, direct me, lead me to see with eyes of faith. If you said that, He heard it. There's a box there. It says, I recommitted my life to Jesus today, both online and in your connection cards. Drop those connection cards in the offering boxes uh, as you leave in just a few moments. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right. All right. Put your hands together for the Lord. All right. I'm going to share some things going on about the vision. I want to invite our team to come up on stage because we're all united in this vision. We're excited about our vision. So give it up for our team here. And others are working out there right now. But of course, my wife is here. All right. So I want to share some of these things, the thoughts and plans and the growth and expansion of of Seven San Diego Church and what's happening. And of course, we're seeing all of this with eyes of faith. And you may have heard some rumors. We certainly have gotten some emails um, and some conversations and text messages, but uh, I want to make sure it's really clear. I'm not leaving 7 San Diego Church, okay? So I just want to make sure that's clear right off. Yeah. I think that's important to to start from the beginning because when something new happens, people start making assumptions, and I want to make sure we understand this. When we started this church almost 11 years ago, we named it 7 San Diego Church because our vision has always been to reach more and more and more of San Diego. We've never seen it as a us for no more church. Let's get comfortable and keep it this way, right? We've, we really believe in reaching all of San Diego and, and making a difference. And so as God has moved and blessed us over the years uh, and as we've grown, I've actually become senior pastor of multiple churches over time. So uh, in 2010, while still being senior pastor of Seven San Diego Church, I became senior pastor of a church called Stone Lake Church here in Lakeside. And over time, our mission, our vision, our values were integrated into Stone Lake Church and became one church. And for a while, we were one church in two locations, as a matter of fact. And then three and a half years ago, um, I became senior pastor of Living Hope Church on this campus while still being senior pastor of Seven San Diego Church. And then we integrated over, it took us about a year and a half to really integrate over time to be one church here. So we've done this Uh, Before Each time I became senior pastor of another church, we brought our mission, our vision, our values, our culture that we've built at seven into that new situation. Okay? And we're doing it again. So, however, this one is unique. Each of the churches that we've taken over leadership of has been smaller than us. So the implementation of our vision, mission, and values, while it took time, it was a little bit easier, a little bit quicker, because that church was smaller uh, than us. Even though Living Hope was smaller on this campus, again, it took uh, quite some time to really get our vision and values through it. But I think we'd all agree, three and a half years later, we're really, really glad that we did this. Yeah? Okay. All right. One, you got it. 
Because we've seen more people say yes to Jesus, more people get baptized, more addictions broken, more marriages saved, more kids and youth coming to know Jesus. I can go on and on. More people growing in faith because we decided we're going to be on this campus. Right. So that's very important. Um, not only have we been able to reach the people that were here at Living Hope, but because of our location, we've been able to reach the fourteen or 16,000 cars that go by every single day. They get a message of love, whether they ever step foot on this campus or not. They get a message of love through the signs we put out. You matter to God, you matter to us. No perfect people allowed. Uh, broken halos. Things that our community can relate to. They can say, you know what? <laughs> I need to check that out. Because we believe... Whether they step on campus or not, we're in this community. We need to be a gift to our community. So our campus needs to look beautiful. So when our neighbors drive by, they go, sweet, that looks nice. And we've heard so many great comments about that. It's just important that we're good witnesses uh, in our community. And so, um, uh, where am I? Okay, so... Yeah, anyway. So the next church... (laughs) So the next church that we're doing this with is going to be Skyline Church in Rancho San Diego. So right now they're announcing that I am the candidate to be their next senior pastor. And so what officially will be happening pending a vote on September 30th is I will be senior pastor of Skyline Church and 7 San Diego Church. Now over time, it will take time, we'll be implementing our vision, our mission, our values in a whole other area of San Diego that, man, we just wouldn't be able to reach otherwise. And so we see it as an incredible expansion opportunity for for who we are, for what we're about as a church, what we see through the Word of God. So, again, technically, I'll be senior pastor of both churches and pending a vote by the Skyline congregation on September 30th. If it all goes positively, then by the end of the year, this will all be taking shape. All right? But we know through our experiences of leading change with other churches, it's going to take time to get our DNA, our vision, our mission, our values. We also know that some of you live closer that way. It's only 15 minutes away, 20 minutes away, depending on traffic. And some of you will end up over there. And that's, it's going to be one church, two locations. And what we love about that, of course, is the expansion opportunities, but people who live closer to there inviting their oikos uh, to be able to say, hey, we got a church over here as well. And as I mentioned, I'm asking for your patience, your flexibility as we navigate what this might look like. I'm asking you to be praying about this. Our whole staff team uh, is excited about it. We had a meeting on Thursday with other core leaders and volunteers. And, man, everybody's excited about the growth and the potential there. We know we're jam-packed on this campus, as I mentioned. We know that uh, we met with the architects Uh, to design a bigger place, and they gave us a figure of about seven years before we can get a major use permit. And what they told us was you can spend about $110,000 trying to get those permits, and at the end of it, they could tell you no. And you spent $110,000, which they had just experienced with uh, someone uh, out here in what's the county of San Diego. So we realized that that's probably a long ways off, longer than we would like. This seems to give us an opportunity to keep growing, keep moving forward. I would imagine um, some of your questions might be, what's going to change here? And the reality is almost nothing. For those of you watching online, absolutely nothing. Um, For those of you uh, here, you know, that come every day, we'll be transitioning to more teaching through live video. Uh, We'll have a different screen, a whole setup. We're going to do a hologram, so I'll walk. No, I'm just kidding. But um, (laughs) no. And then so we're, we're setting up a fiber optic situation here, if all goes well, that um, sometimes, you know, I'll be live speaking at Skyline and it'll be a video here, but sometimes I'll be live here. It'll be video over there, as well as our guest speakers and our staff that speak regularly as well. And we just feel like it gives us that opportunity to expand and grow like God has called us to, uh, to do. I thought it was ironic. Last service, I realized that when we came down to start the church, our first meetings were actually held over at Skyline. Our first team meetings, because we didn't have a facility. We didn't have a facility to meet in. So we asked Skyline, can we meet over at your, your classroom space? And they let us meet there as we had our first membership classes and our first uh, vision casting meetings over at Skyline. I thought that was pretty interesting and kind of a full circle uh, kind of idea. We've always been a kingdom-minded church, and obviously if we were only thinking about ourselves, we just, we're not going to do this. But we truly believe in kingdom. We believe in helping other churches. We believe in making a difference in our community, and we feel like we have an opportunity 
now uh, to do that. So we're excited, we're fired up, and what I'm asking you to do is if some of you are questioning, you're wondering, I just need you to trust us. For 11 years, we've been faithful. For 11 years, we haven't led you astray, and we're not going to lead you astray now. So if you have any concerns, thoughts, questions, after the next service, we're going to have a town hall meeting. So you can voice your opinion, your thoughts, ask us any questions you might have about it, and that'll be uh, after the next service. So again, fired up. I think it gives us an opportunity to help people find and follow Jesus seven days a week, just a little bit more in another area. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We're excited. One church, two locations, reach more people of San Diego. We give you the praise uh, for that opportunity. And we know that there's a lot that goes into that. We know that that's a lot that could be complicated. But we also know you care about reaching lost people. And you care about growing your kingdom here on earth. And we're thankful to be a part of it. We look forward to all that it might mean in the future. I picture those people over there in that area that don't know you. And soon they're going to have an opportunity and be invited to a church that loves them, that cares about their community, that is focused on them, making a difference in their lives. And and we're going to hear stories of people's lives put back together, addictions broken, kids coming to know you, like we see here. So we give you the praise, we give you the thanks. It's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Put your hands together. Come on.